It's the middle of the night, February 26th, in Hendersonville, Tennessee. 15-year-old Sebastian Rogers should be safe, asleep in his bed, in his home. But now everyone is wondering, was he home? Was he safe? Sebastian's mom, Katie Proudfoot, says she went to wake up Sebastian for school, but when she went to get him up, he wasn't there. She looked in the house. He wasn't there. He was gone, vanished. After she called 911, the law enforcement search was on. It was wide, it was extensive, but yet again, no sign of Sebastian. Katie believes he left the home barefoot with his glasses, but where would he go? Why would he leave? And how could no one find him? Sebastian's father, Seth Rogers, shares custody and has been out searching for his son. Meanwhile, Katie says her husband had to go back to work out of town and Katie left her home to be with him. Tonight, we have an update from law enforcement. We'll take a look at the latest, break down the timeline and take a look at the search as we investigate the mysterious disappearance of Sebastian Rogers. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And where is Sebastian Rogers? Where is he? This, this case, it's as if he just disappeared and vanished. But that doesn't happen. That can't happen. That's impossible. It doesn't work that way. Either something happened to him and someone did something, or he left the house, or someone broke into the house and took him, a 15-year-old, but something had to happen here, yet a month into this, it, it seems like, like the public, the family, the everyone's kind of clueless as to what happened here. How does a 15-year-old just vanish like that? Who's at home with his mom? How does that happen? It doesn't, doesn't make sense to me that there wouldn't be some level of some obvious clue, whether it's something happening in the house or something happening before they came back to the house or evidence that he left whether he ran away or was going to meet someone or if there was some, some text message or something on his phone, but like none of that, none of those obvious things that we see in so many cases, as we saw in the Madeline Soto case, became very obvious very quickly. Like this one, no. It's the same day Madeline Soto went missing. But you look at what people are saying and I'm listening and it's like, Okay, he's gone, but that doesn't just happen. People don't just vanish. Now, what we're hearing from law enforcement is that all the parents are cooperating. You know, his mother and father aren't married anymore. His mother is, is remarried, so he has a stepfather, and, and law enforcement is reporting everyone's cooperating. No one's, like, lawyering up. No one's shutting down. So to whatever that means, to, to that extent, there's no seeming uh, pushback at all, that there's a level of cooperation, which is huge, which is important, because every investigation begins with those who are closest to, to the victim, the one who's missing here. And you, you've got to understand and investigate them and get information from them. That information is most crucial in all of this. So mom and stepdad cooperating. However, uh, stepdad's got to go back to work. So he left the area and mom has now left the house as well to be with him working out of town because of the type of work he does. Meanwhile, his father is searching, going out there and, and literally looking for his son. And it's been a month. That's a long time. This, this disappearance began the same day as Madeline Soto. And you think about the two cases where, where um, we are in one versus the other. And the longer it takes, the, the, the more worried you get that 
They're not going to be able to figure this out. They're not going to be able to find him. I mean, could he have, like, tiptoed out and is, and is hiding somewhere or running away from something or exploring or doing something? I, you don't just vanish. It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. There has to be something that can lead to what happened here. So today we got a, an update um, from investigators. And you listen to the information, and, and whenever you have one of these updates, and they do it because there's, there's pressure on investigators. They know how big the story is, how big the case is. They know how desperate uh, family members are and the community, and people want to help, and people are looking for information. And there's also the factor of by speaking, you put it back into the news cycle, and Sebastian's face will be, once again, will be in places all over the internet, on television, um, and other places. So I want you to take a look and a listen to this, and there's, there's a little bit of new information in there, but there are some important things that were said today. It wasn't the longest press conference, but it was significant. Let's take a listen. Sebastian has been missing since late February. The investigation remains ongoing with steadfast support from the Sumner County Sheriff's Office, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigations, and many other local and federal resources. We are exploring every lead that comes in and every tip that comes in. Uh, nothing would make me happier than to wake up tomorrow morning with a tip that cracks this case wide open and we find Sebastian and bring him home. The parents have been cooperative throughout at the beginning of the investigation. Um, they have pretty much done whatever law enforcement has asked of them. Um, at, at this point, we don't have any evidence. There is not any kind of an indication that there is a criminal element involved. Um, but we are keeping options open. We don't know what has happened. We don't know where Sebastian is right now, so we are pursuing any and all avenues. Um, we do want to caution some, uh, there are some media, social media elements out there who purport to have information that is direct from the in investigation. Um, I just want to reiterate that that is not the case. Um, the, some of the information that is being provided on some of the social media channels is inaccurate, incomplete. Um, we don't want this to damage the investigation. So we would just caution anyone who is following the case to just use some caution as to what you see and what you believe. There were some glasses found in the past few days. Were, have you been able to identify that they were Sebastian? We are still investigating. Do you believe he's still alive? And what are you guys going to continue working on? My hope and prayer is that Sebastian is still alive, yes. Uh, we're going to continue to work on this investigation and follow up every tip and lead that comes in. Uh, some of this may revert back to us going over some things that we've already done for the sixth, seventh, or eighth time. Uh, a fresh set of eyes never hurt anything. We're, we're going to continue to work to find Sebastian. Let me put it to you like this. If my kid was missing, this is the team I'd want on it. Uh, the men and women of the Sumner County Sheriff's Office, of the Tennessee Bureau of Investigations, the FBI partners, the other local agencies, the Secret Service, everyone who's had a hand in this case is doing everything they can to find Sebastian. Okay, a couple of things uh, from that. First, um, you know, social media. Social media is important to keep the story in the news, keep Sebastian's face in the news. There's a downside. You know, there's a yin and a yang to everything. Uh, there are some on social media and who may report things that are not factual, uh, for whatever reason that they're doing it. Uh, but the bottom line, you keep his face in the news, that's important when someone is missing and they have no idea what happened. You heard him. We have no idea. We don't know what happened to him. We haven't seen anything criminal that would lead us that way. I get that, but he, like, vanished? Like, he didn't take his phone? He just ran away? That, I, I, it doesn't make sense. It's not sitting well with me tonight. Like, just vanishing. It doesn't work that way. Now, we also heard that they found some glasses in the last couple of days, and they're still investigating it. That, too, I, I'm, I'm not clear on that. I, how long would it take to figure out if they're his glasses? You know, we, we have pictures with different glasses. We have parents. Um, what glasses are at home, right? Because he's gone. Does he have more than one pair? Where are they? What do they look like? Okay, let's, great news tonight for us, though. 
Joining us from Nashville, Tennessee, reporter with Scripps News Nashville, Nick Barris is with us, uh, covering the story unlike anyone else and unlike any other um, uh, station or organization on this one. Nick, great to see you again tonight. Um, how would you describe where this investigation is? I see this as a mystery. It's baffling to me. Um, is this a criminal investigation? Is this a missing persons investigation? How is this, is, is, there, a, is there an ongoing search? Mm, yeah. What is this? What is this right now? Yeah, I'll tell you, Vinny, uh, I agree with you and your take on this. Um, my take is they say that there is no sign of any foul play at this point, but they are not ruling it out. And, and I couldn't agree with you more that a child does not wander off on their own and simply vanish, vanish without any trace unless someone else is involved. That's my take. But they say at this point, parents, everything they've done with them have been vetted um, and that they're not considered suspects at this point and they've cooperated, no one else. But they also uh, were very pointed today. Um, there have been some reports um, saying, oh, well, the parents have been cleared. No, wrong. No one, according to Eric Craddock, who is the chief deputy with the sheriff's department who's leading this investigation, has been cleared. No one has been cleared. They consider all options. And I would say right now it continues to be somewhat of a search but they're waiting for more tips to come in. And frankly, just like you and I, I think authorities are frustrated and befuddled. So, and, and that's a great distinction, right? Cooperating versus does not equal cleared. Cooperating yep. does not equal cleared. So yep. that's because they don't know what happened. How could you clear people if you don't know what happened? It, it, it makes yeah. no sense to me. Makes <laughs> no sense, right? So describe for us, the, the house he was living in, the neighborhood he was living in, the, the geography, the topography, the population, um, that sort of stuff. Yeah. This is, a, uh, I'd say, uh, an upscale neighborhood, uh, very nice homes. Um, he lived in a nice home, um, a neighborhood um, residential, like anyone else. It's a, 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 a typical residential neighborhood, nothing out in the country off alone. Neighbors all within close proximity, some common greenways in between. What's interesting about this neighborhood, as upscale and nice as it is, there are absolutely no street lights, okay, or sidewalks. And so at night, that neighborhood is pitch dark. And so one of the questions many people had was, why didn't any of these homes, many of which have security cameras, ring cameras, why did none of them seem to pick up any video of anything that night, almost anything? And I will say I was uh, one reporter. I'm the only reporter so far to have aired what was some, some video from a nearby home capturing what appears to be lights, possibly flashlights in the proximity of the home the night he disappeared. Now, law enforcement, not long after I aired that, okay, one, contacted me asking me where I got it, and I cannot reveal my source. And second, said that at this point, there's no evidentiary value to the, that video. Well, today in my interview, and by the way, you showed some of the press conference or news conference, I had a chance to sit down one-on-one -on -one for a good period of time just with Eric Craddock, he and I. And he said at this point, yeah, no evidentiary value to that video I had that shows that you see here what appears to be some lights, possibly flashlights outside the home. But he says, that's the way it stands right now. And depending on what develops, that video and those lights could become more important to the case, depending on what they learn moving forward. So, uh, you know, and, and by the way, in terms of what information they've shared, I couldn't agree with you more. They, they did say that they found some glasses in the area, wondering if they are Sebastian's. That shouldn't take any time at all to figure out. Um, and they didn't say if they had. That, that should be able to be determined almost instantaneously. And I'm not sure why they haven't or why they haven't revealed that information yet. Because the community's searching. They want to help, right? They want to help. Everybody's looking for him. Um, yeah. From the oh, interviews, sure. his yeah. dad is worried to death. Um, so let's get back to that light for just a moment, though, because the, the way you described the neighborhood, pitch black, so you're seeing some light at night. And this is what? This is like 3 in the morning? Yeah, it's right around 3 in the morning. It's within the scope of the time they believe Sebastian left the home, which would have been, they think, midnight to 6 a.m. the next morning when he was discovered missing. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's dark. 
And again, I don't want to oversell it. Uh, it's been analyzed apparently by the TBI and law enforcement. At this point, they say it's no evidentiary value. But as far as I know, it's the only video of any kind that shows what appears to be some lights in the back. Who knows? Maybe there's some kind of reflection. But if you watch what I have there, you see lights, two subjects moving, and it appears to be something. But again, at this point, and, and the parents have talked to law enforcement as well. They say, we don't believe that this is a key piece of evidence in the case. But today, Eric Craddock said, that's the way it stands now. But they don't know what they don't know. And with time, that could become significant, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, I, I think it's pretty significant, considering there's nothing else out there. Like, light just doesn't appear. It has to be nothing something. Else. Yeah. It, it has to be something. Like, people don't just vanish, and lights just don't appear out of nowhere do we know if he had a flashlight right. that night right right <clears throat> yeah the 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 word from his his mother when she went to look for him what they discovered missing the way i understand it is uh, a flashlight and that he left without his shoes barefoot which again is something that's that's very um, kind of uh, confounding because, you know, his own father said as a child, Sebastian walked barefoot into a, uh, a fire ant hill pile and they, they just ate him up. And he never forgot that experience. And from that day on, as a child who suffers from autism, that stuck with him and he would not go outside without his shoes and socks. So you're telling me in the middle of the night, he grabs a flashlight, walks out of his home barefoot. It just doesn't make sense. Possibly he went out quickly to check on something with the idea of coming back in, but obviously he never did. Um, so uh, that's something kind of perplexing about how all that played out. And did he take a flashlight and why? What was he looking for? Where did he go? But dogs going outside, outside just the general area of the home where you would expect Minnie to find his scent because he lived there. Anything off the property where he would have walked, Dogs didn't find anything. They supposedly may be tracked to a nearby pond, which they then not only had divers go into, but then drained and found nothing. It's, again, as though he vanished into thin air. Nick Burris, um, I'm sure we're going to be speaking again about this. Uh, I really appreciate your time today. And I know you're, like, working overtime like you do every day, tracking these stories. Sure. Uh, great to speak with you. Scripps News Nashville, Nick Burris. Check it out, folks. Uh, his stuff is online as well if you're around the country. It's great, great work. Thanks so much, Nick. Thank you, Vinny. Uh, let's talk more about this search. Joining us uh, from the Gulf Shore of Alabama, a press and communications officer for the United Cajun Navy, Kevin LaFond is with us. And the reason um, we asked you to be on is, is you guys were involved at some point in the search here. Uh, give us a little bit of the backstory, Kevin, on how the United Cajun Navy in Alabama ends up in Tennessee searching for Sebastian. Well, it all started with Riley Strain. Um, I appreciate having me on today. Um, Riley Strain's uh, search, as you know, ended it the way it did with, with us discovering where he was as a group, all of the searchers together. Um, we don't claim any fame to that, but we are part of it. Um, there was an outcry on social media and to us directly uh, from the parents to get involved um, with the search here and that's what we did with the search for sebastian we got ourselves organized and we were together we had everything there anyway so we said you know what we're here so let's do this so you said the parents is, is that both uh the father and the mother and the stepfather like all three contacted you um it was primarily seth seth asked us to come okay so that so the, the biological father okay now i also understand yeah. that you had to call off your search efforts because of some threats. Can you tell us some of the details there? What's the nature of these threats? Is this people who don't want you on their property because it's private property? Is this people who don't want you to find something? What, what exactly is that all about? Well, there was a, a private property and also state and federal land issue at the beginning that we had to get permission for to be on those uh, those lands. But we did get permission. We got the okay to do that. So that was never an issue. Um, we had some bad actors that were showing up in person and also harassing online and through phone calls. Um, we were getting um, all kinds of messages saying that we're going to be doxxed, uh, we're going to be run out of town, we're going to be bullied, um, and then, then the death threats came. And that's when we got the real serious about you know, having to reformat how we're going about this and think about the safety of the volunteers. It, it really was to that point. Um, so now we have to shift gears and, and move into more of a private phase where we, uh, you know, we're not forward facing. 
Well, let me ask you this. The people who are threatening you stopping a search for a missing child, um, did you provide that information to law enforcement? Because I would think if someone's trying to stop you from finding this child, maybe that's someone law enforcement should be looking at. Uh, and I would say that you're drawing a reasonable conclusion there for sure. And yes, the authorities were notified. Um, we have incident reports with the MNPD. Um, they're the ones that came out to uh, the, the original call when our folks were basically barricaded inside of a hotel room. Wow, barricaded inside of a hotel room because you're in town searching That's for a correct. missing teenager? Yeah, and that's very strange. It's never happened to us before. And certainly uh, with what you're reporting earlier about uh, are there being so much cooperation, this being so difficult really didn't add up. That is, I've, I've never heard it. Like, you obviously haven't come across this. You guys roll into town. You're not getting paid, are you? You're, like you're rolling into town trying to help. Mm -hmm. These are volu we're volunteers. Uh, we do this all around the country. When when the, the families reach out and ask for help, try to do as much as we can where we can. In this case, we were close by. So it made sense to go ahead and, and get involved and start helping. Um, but it brought some bad folks out of the woodwork, and we're not quite sure why that is. That And let's hope law enforcement follows up on that and figures that out because, I mean, the obvious conclusion, again, if you're trying to stop people from searching for a missing teenager, you're afraid, oh, maybe they may find him. Um, so was there a particular place where you were searching at the time all this started to happen? And if so, um, is, is, is that a place that you were unable to search? Uh, our searches were hampered is the probably polite way to put it. Um, we, we didn't get to do nearly as much as we wanted to, but it really didn't matter where we were. Um, it seemed that this trouble followed us. That is extremely unfortunate, especially given the nature of what's at stake here, uh, a missing child. There he is, uh, Sebastian Rogers. Kevin Lafon from the United Cajun Navy, um, appreciate your time tonight. And uh, on behalf of families, we, we all appreciate Volunteers coming together to help families in need, people that are so desperate that are missing loved ones. Uh, so I hope this doesn't deter you, and I, I don't think it will, from continuing the work that you guys do. Not at all. If I could say anything, I'd say, you know, everybody be hopeful. Um, volunteers are rallying together, us and others, and it doesn't matter who's front and center. We're going to get this done. All right. Thanks so much, Kevin. Appreciate it. When we come back, folks, we're going to continue our investigation into this uh, story. Uh, I'm going to bring in some experts and take a listen um, to what mom has said and what dad has said, because they've spoken out. They've spoken on television. They've spoken on podcasts. We can take a listen and, and try to figure out what it means and what the story could be here. Plus, coming up next hour. In Boise, Idaho, Chad Daybell on trial facing the death penalty for the murders of his wife, Tammy, and his new wife's children, J.J. and Tylee. Tonight, we speak with Juror 18 from Chad's wife's trial. Would the jury in that case convict Chad? I've been told for years that Tammy would pass away at a young age. And I had no idea that Lori would even be a part of my life. I just knew that I'd my life segments. We are underway in the trial of Doomsday Prophet Chad Daybell. Prosecutors say they will seek the death penalty against him. Investigators have recovered human remains at Chad Daybell's residence. There's no way, Lori, and I should never come up with this. His wife, Lori Valla Daybell, has already been convicted. Now, will her husband end up with the same fate? It's just so hard to know where the truth ends. It's the doomsday prophet, Chad Daybell, on trial. The house was searched at least 10 times. Dogs? Dogs, yep. None of them, to my understanding, um, were actually on a, on, on a trail that was following Sebastian. 15-year-old Sebastian Rogers was last seen alive on Sunday, February 25th. His mother, Katie Proudfoot, shared the details of what she and Sebastian did the day before he was reported missing in an interview with the Chronicles of Olivia YouTube channel. 
We went and picked up our niece. Yes, uh, yeah. yeah, I got a call and um, asked if I could go and pick her up, and I did. And so um, we went and did that. We went to BJ's. Um, had a good time there. He ate a colossal popcorn. Um, came home to put groceries away because we bought snacks because, you know, he's 15 and snacks. Um, we went to the bowling alley and then from there we went to dinner. Came home. Um, he took out the trash because that's his chore. He takes the can to the end of the driveway. About nine o'clock, told him to go to bed. He's come out of his room where he was playing, and he said, all right, good night, Mama, good night, puppies, I love you, and went to bed. Um, he was doing something in his room, because about an hour later, I heard some noise, and I was like, I don't care what you're doing in there, but go to sleep. And um, about midnight, I got up, and I went to bed. And um, six o'clock, I went to wake him up for school Monday morning, and that's when... He wasn't here. So that's a description of, of what happened. I mean, it was a full day the day before. And then in the morning, he's, he's, he's not there. Just, just vanished. Without a trace. Let's bring in our guests. Joining us from Los Angeles, California, clinical and forensic neuropsychologist and author of the book, The New Rules of Attachment, Dr. Judy Ho is with us. Joining us from Salt Lake City, Utah, private investigator Jason Jensen. Also with us in Los Angeles, California, retired FBI special agent. He's also a lawyer, and he's a screenwriter, and he's a friend of ours, Bobby Chacon. Um, Dr. Judy Ho, let me begin with you. Um, he's been described as being a child with autism somewhere on the spectrum. Um, parents described him as bright. Some of the issues were more socially um, connected. So, knowing that, does any of this make sense that a child like that would get up or maybe not even go to sleep, middle of the night, pitch dark outside? That's the way the neighborhood is. There's no street lights. Pitch dark, grab a flashlight, leave the shoes and the phone and everything at home, and, and go somewhere. Well, they, the autism spectrum is a very wide one. So we have some individuals who have a higher level of special needs, whereas other ones are very, very high functioning. And so we don't know as much about exactly where his functioning was at the time of this missing incident. And also if there were any other co-occurring issues, any other mental health concerns that they maybe had, other social concerns that were plaguing this child at that time, maybe any additional stressors. It doesn't sound right for any child, um, whether they're on the spectrum or not, to be walking away barefoot with a flashlight and just disappear without a trace. And so there's a lot to unpack here. There must have been some lead up. Um, I hope that we can hear more about what he was like in the days leading up to his disappearance. Jason Jensen, something that I, that I picked up on here. Apparently they have dogs dogs in the house if he's getting up and there you see we have one like this at home tiny you're up in the middle of the night he's up he's also got snakes um but how about the fact that there's dogs you got to open that front door mom doesn't hear anything maybe she's a sound sleeper maybe she's got a CPAC machine I don't know I don't know but what what are the what are the questions that you have tonight about what may have happened here with him wandering off for some reason? Well, Ben, uh, you know, there's a lot here, really. But concerning the dogs, I have dogs, and if I walk out of the house, they typically don't react in the middle of the night. Now, maybe if I come back in, they'll want to investigate who came back into the home. But other than that, I mean, given the fact that Sebastian is a 15-year-old, with functioning ASD, which is autism spectrum disorder, it is common for for elopement behavior to occur. So, you know, when mom addressed him the way she did in the middle of the night, was it upsetting? Did he run out of the house? You know, I'd like to know more about that. And if he's had a history of 
running away before. Now, um, Bobby Chacon, something else we learned today, and I was a little confused by it during the uh, press conference. They're getting help from the FBI in this. They also said Secret Service. Is there any reason why the Secret Service would be involved in this investigation? That kind of struck me as uh, a little bit unusual. And then I'd also like um, your thoughts about um, the search here. Well, Secret Service does a lot of things online, like online crimes. They, they do do a lot of, the FBI does as well, but the Secret Service does, and we partner with them sometimes on these online crimes. Now, I can say I have a, a relative, a close relative with Asperger's, and as a, uh, a teenager, be, because she had this disorder where it was very awkward for her socially, um, she found it much easier to be online and develop relationships with people online, or not relationships, but connections with people online. So, I mean, it could be that the Secret Service is brought in to look at his online activity um, to see if somebody <clears throat> was either attempting to groom him or or then set up a meeting with him or, you know, uh, convinced him that, you know, they wanted to talk to him or see him apart, apart from his parents or whatever. Um, so, so it could be a situation like that. They're looking into whether he had, I don't know, if he had access to the Internet, if he had his own. Uh, accounts on, on, on social media or things like that. So that's something possible. I don't know this. This is conjecture on my part, but it could be something that the, the you can enlist the Secret Service um, to look at his online activity. Uh, somebody could have lured him out of that house uh, with online uh, communications. That makes sense to me now. That makes some sense to me. Okay, on a YouTube live stream this week, Seth Rogers, Sebastian's father, told the host of the Pascal show that he saw video evidence that his son was alive on Sunday, February 25th. Let's take a listen. I had requested video proof that my son was alive after I spoke to him on Thursday. What footage was that? They showed me footage of him leaving Texas Roadhouse and getting into his mama's vehicle with Texas, her. Texas Roadhouse. So he was getting in a vehicle with Katie Proudfoot from eating at Texas Roadhouse, correct? Yes. Okay, Jason Jensen, they're out to eat. Seems like there's cousins there as well. Um, it would seem to be extremely important to hear from all of those folks if they saw or noticed anything or if he had a conversation with one of his cousins about something that maybe he wanted to do that night. I mean, t to me, this is like the last true proof of life that we have um, of Sebastian. Benny, you would want to basically recreate his entire day and put the pieces together of all the conversations that he had, whether there was, you know, some problems at home, whether he had a, a love interest that nobody was familiar with. Oftentimes cousins say things amongst each other that they won't say to their parents. Dr. Judy Ho, I want to ask you about the parents' behavior here as well. It's been a month. It's been a, it's been a while. Now, step, his stepfather apparently had to go back to work. He operates big machinery, doesn't, you know, goes on the road, lives out of an RV to do it, um, and is out of town. But mom also left the house that her son disappeared from and is with um, her husband. Your thoughts about that? And we all, I know, react to things differently, cope differently. Um, right. What are your thoughts about mom leaving that house um, and, and spending her time now, not from where Sebastian disappeared, but out of town uh, with Sebastian's stepfather. Well, Vinny, I think that a lot of people are saying, how could you do that when you should be combing your neighborhood, figuring out where your son is? How could you just leave and, and get out of town? Of course, Katie's explanation with that is that she was starting to get death threats. She was having people start casing the home, uh, commenting on you know what they believe is her negative behavior and that she was trying to get a little bit of peace and uh, a little bit of safety. So of course that that could be an explanation but I think that there's so many people who are saying but if I was the parent I would just be going to all of the places that I know my son loves to go to. Look at all the places where he had friends, where he liked to spend his time, what kind of hobbies was he engaging in the neighborhood. I want to find out as much as possible just trying to do almost my own work ahead of what the police can do and and I think that's something else that was concerning is that apparently the biological father said that there was a CPS call made um, on Katie a little bit earlier 
very unclear about more details or a timeline and whether there was any follow-up, but apparently biological father found out about the CPS call from a podcast and not from Katie herself or from CPS. And so there are some questions there about, are there some other concerns about this child's welfare and safety that was missed at an earlier time? Absolutely. They have shared custody. I mean, dad right. should, should know if there's something going yes. on. Wow. Okay, everyone stay where you are. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about a landfill search. They searched the landfill. Now, there's no evidence of any crime, and they're searching a landfill. Is this normal? Bobby Chacon's going to answer that question when we come back. safe to say crews have searched just about everywhere for the autistic teen within a five mile radius of the home and have found nothing. But one thing they did not search is the garbage and that is why Sumner County deputies and Kentucky State Police spent the day searching a landfill in White Plains, Kentucky. Why there? Well, News Channel 5 has learned that trash in the Stafford Court neighborhood is picked up every Monday between 5 and 6 a.m. And it was sent to that landfill. So all the trash from the neighborhood dumpsters, including the trash bin at Sebastian's home, was picked up and gone before the teen was even reported missing. Officers are digging through trash and the landfill looking for any clues. They don't know what they'll find, but say the search is part of leaving no stone unturned. There's the possibility some evidence was disposed of in the trash. Remember, he took the trash out. Mom told us that that was one of his responsibilities, to take the trash out. It was garbage day that Monday. Um, take a look here. This is from uh, Scripps News Nashville. Uh, the search of the Kentucky landfill yields no evidence. Investigators with the Sumner County Sheriff's Office searched the landfill in Kentucky where trash um, from missing 15-year-old Sebastian Rogers neighborhood went. Officials stated no leads or evidence pertaining to Sebastian's whereabouts were found during that search. Let's bring back in our guests. We have with us Dr. Judy Ho, Jason Jensen, and Bobby Chacon, retired FBI special agent. Bobby, what's your take on the uh, search of the landfill? Well, I've been involved in a number of landfills and the FBI landfill searches in the FBI. We used to do them quite routinely. Um, I think it's exactly what your reporter said. It's, you know, that, that effort of no stone unturned. Um, you have to look everywhere that's possible or else, you know, you'll be called into question on how thorough you did your job. You know, uh, if, if say six, eight, 10 weeks down, something of value was found there by somebody else, you know, the first question would be why did law enforcement search that landfill? They knew where his garbage went and, and, and uh, the trash from his neighborhood. So I think that that's what it is. It's a thoroughness thing. I, when I ran the dive team, I was involved in a number of searches of ponds and lakes in neighborhoods where children went missing, where there was absolutely no indication that the child was in the water, but we, we searched those bodies of water to be thorough and to make sure that the child didn't fall in there or didn't end up in there some other way. But but you do this, you you do these searches on places even when you have no indication because you know everybody else is covering leads and if you have the resources to do it, you need to do it. And and I think that that's what this was. Katie Proudfoot and her husband, as I mentioned, left their home in Hendersonville, Tennessee, since the search for Sebastian began. In an interview posted on Twitter, Nancy Grace questioned the mother about her choice to leave the house where she last saw her son. Did you leave the home also, Ms. Proudfoot? Yes, ma'am. Why? To accompany my husband going back to work and then I'm coming back. Okay, when will you be back? Do you know yet? No, not yet. Are you concerned about being away while the search is ongoing? Absolutely, I am. Then why are you going? Because my son could be anywhere and we're looking everywhere and anywhere. Okay, Jason Jensen, your reaction. Yeah, well, it just really seemed like, uh, you know, I, I hate to judge the reaction. It doesn't seem very supportive of looking for her son in the context. It's like she it sounds more like she's driven to be near her husband than stay at home where her son, who, if he did run away, may return at any moment. So 
I understand where Nancy Grace was going with the line of questioning. It sounds like she's trying to say you should be home. That's where a mother should be. And that's kind of Nancy's personality. Well, yeah, I, I've been interviewed by Nancy. I mean, Nancy and I worked together at Court TV when I was a correspondent at the courthouse. She would, you know, ask me lots of questions. It's, it's not an easy spot for anyone, but let alone um, someone in that position where your, your child is missing. Dr. Uh, Judy Ho, what was interesting there, though, she didn't mention in that answer necessarily the fear of, you know, the threats and everything. And I think that's real in the world. I mean, the, the United mm -hmm. Cajun Navy, you know, was pulling back because of threats. So I could see it happening to her the way there's been a spotlight on her as well. Uh, did you see anything in that interview of note? Well, first of all, I agree with you, Vinny. I definitely think that the threat is probably real, and we can definitely see how that can happen, especially in this day and age, and all of that internet sleuthing that so many people are doing, rolling up their sleeves and trying to play detective um, and taking it into their own hands. But uh, again, it's so hard to judge someone's reaction. I know that everyone deals with grief and loss and stress so differently. But she definitely seemed a little subdued to me. Um, that is concerning. I don't know if she's subdued because she feels traumatized and scared and, you know, she doesn't know how to answer Nancy's questions. She is a tough interviewer. Or if that type of emotional disconnection and distancing is something else that's more indicative of their relationship. And when I say relationship, I'm talking about her relationship with her son. Um, the priority of wanting to be with your husband in that moment, you can understand that. Maybe you want emotional support, but at the same time, husband is hours away. Yeah. Child's unlikely to be that far away. So what kind of search is she actually doing and accomplishing while she is there with her husband? Uh, Bobby Chacon, I only have five seconds. So I just need a number from you, unfortunately. Zero to 10, how confident are you that they will be able to locate Sebastian? 10 being absolutely. Well, eight, but that doesn't that doesn't mean alive or not alive, so unfortunately. Right. Okay. We're out of time for tonight, but obviously we're going to stay on this story. Dr. Judy Ho, Jason Jensen, Bobby Chacon, appreciate your valuable time and insight tonight.